Oh, Trumpy is calling you, Mark. I told you never to call me here. <laughs> Episode 293, Congressman M. Day's presentation to the RMC on Saturday morning, 16 June 2018. On September 11th of this year, actually September 13th, I will have been there for seven years. You know how many times I got the chance to vote on, on anything of substance and immigration on the floor of the House of Representatives? And by the way, been a fairly active seven years on that issue. Zero. Zero. And so I tell people, and you've, some of you have probably heard, I can't come back here and defend nothing. Hey, let me tell you why the fact that we did nothing on one of the major issues of, of our time, regardless of where you're at, let me tell you why doing nothing was a winner on that. We passed one. I, I know, I'm, I'm with you. It's like healthcare hasn't gone anywhere. Absolutely right. Well, of course, and then in the family meetings, like, well, I don't want to bring something to the floor, the speaker says. I don't want to bring something to the floor that doesn't have a chance of being law. Really? It's like, well, let me see. There was that little health care thing. There was the ag bill. It's like, where is it written that you, if you, my translation of that phrase is this. If you tell me that I can't bring something to the floor that I don't, of the house that I'm not sure the Senate's going to pass or the administration's going to sign, then in my humble opinion, you're in the wrong business. My job is to get my stuff or stuff I support through the House of Representatives. Nothing matters if you don't get it through there to start. Healthcare is a great example. It's like, hey, was our, was our bill the answer to everything? No, but it was an important first step. And you can ask the same question. How many think status quo in healthcare is a great thing right now? Yeah, I don't even need to hesitate for that one. So anyhow, back to kind of wrap up the discharge petition. So, so we had the family meetings and we had that, well, we can't bring it. It's like, whatever, just tell me whether or not. Oh, but I do want to say this. So and until the president kind of did a little impromptu yesterday, we were going to vote on Goodlatte's bill and the compromise bill, which the speaker put together. Oh, the same thing he could have done with that one in the discharge petition. Oh, but I digress. Um, so I don't know if we're voting on it next week or not. We're supposed to. But, but I, I just want to say this. So it goes from, and, and by the way, here's another small fact. March 6th, the one that's like 90 days in a week or so in the rearview mirror, that's when the president told the Congress, that's your deadline, I want you to do something on this DACA thing because I'm ending the program that was executive order for Obama. He told us that six months in advance, September. You got till March 6th. By the way, you that, that read the Constitution, I've perused it now and then, and I said the thing, I said, I'm not a constitutional guy. Oh my God, he's not a constitutional guy. It's like, no, 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 not in the, not in the whatever sense. It's just that I wouldn't hold myself up as a scholar. But there is a line in there that even I understand. Shall establish a system to regulate naturalization. That's immigration. That's in the Constitution. It's not states' rights. It's not a tweener. It's not prosecutorial discretion. It's Congress's job to establish a system of naturalization. So you're sitting here after 35 years and listening to the Beach Boys on cassettes and border issues and sanctuary city issues and all the whole nine yards going, we want to vote. will be restricted to just DACA but 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 here's the thing and I don't know what the number is I'll, I'll just tell you and if somebody tells you they do know good for them I'd appreciate seeing how they got to it I don't know whether it's 800,000 I don't know whether it's a million eight but it's a lot of folks okay the facts as I understand them are these the compromise bill before it goes to rules unless it's amended or something like that this provision says you can go through it, you, you've got to sign up, and you've got to earn status. And that means you go through this provisional period for, I think it's six years, as I recall, it, they just released it uh, late the day before, and it's 300 pages. So we d are trying to do this old fashioned thing called reading it since we've been working on it for a while. Um, and, and so anyhow, th there's one period where you have you, if you do everything right, you're, and, and by the way, it's points. You, so it's kind of merit-based. 
if you've served in the military, you get so many points. If you're a college graduate, you get so many points. You know, what are you doing in terms of the community and bringing value to your community through various and sundry options? And you get points. And if you get over this six year period, and, and I'm not sure on this yet because it's new, but it's like if you acquire a certain number of points, then you get a green card. You get status. And after you get status, if you decide you want to be a citizen, then you go apply to uh, uh, I have EIS. Yeah, I got two of the three letters right. Um, thank, thank you, Arturo. Um, so anyhow, you, 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 you go to something and S and N and, 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 uh, and you apply. But that is a five-year period. So you're talking about if, if you can establish that you've earned the points to be, be merit-based, say, okay, we want you in our neighborhood, then you get a green card and you get status. If then you say, I want to be a citizen, then you start another five-year process. So it's kind of 11 years if, if you want to be a citizen. It stops, arguably, any of the chain migration stuff, which I would really encourage you because people go, we got to stop that chain migration stuff. Okay. But I got to tell you, when I first heard about it, this is another one of those where you go, well, what's the deal? Are you telling me that if somebody brought kids into the country and they entered themselves illegally while the kids were minors, that if the kids are now made citizens, they can turn around and kind of bootstrap their parents in. And so we went back and looked through the stuff and it's like, well, first of all, if you entered without an interview illegally, then guess what? All that stuff that's on the books now that says you got to go back for 10 years. and There is nothing in there about if your son or daughter was a DACA person that now your illegal entry is ignored. And so I'm going, well, so we went through and did the time. And it's like 20 to 25 years. It's like, yeah, you can do it, but you got to go back for the 10. You got to come back. You got to apply. In the existing system, the whole waiting list is like, how many people are on? Like three million and it's ballpark. Anyhow, it's not quick. So I'm sitting there going, well, what's, the, what's the issue? Anyhow, all I'll tell you is this. Our research says chain migration, if, if you were an adult who brought minor children in illegally, if those children, by the way, if this, if this one part passes, if those children after 11 years want to try to sponsor their parents in, if, if they're in the country illegally or whatever, it's like, guess what? I mean, you're talking a few decades, arguably, if everything goes right. So, but nonetheless, one of the things in the DACA thing is, is it, is it ends that whole thing on chain migration. It turns pretty much the whole thing into it'll establish a procedure which basically is merit-based even for the DACA people. So, and right now, a quick read says that's in about an 11-year process. And, and so I'll just tell you, to, to circle around, you're going, well, so what's the answer to the question? A mechanism like that that is not lickety-split, where you earn your status, you don't get to be a citizen, you earn your status, but once you get your status, if you elect to go be a citizen, then you go get in it, under the DACA thing, and it's another five years. So that's over a decade where you're earning your status. And by the way, when you say define earn, it's like you served in the military, you've got a job, you weren't on public service, obviously you're not a criminal justice all-star, blah, 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 things like that. It's like, listen, I'm open-minded to that. I, I, I mean, I don't know how more direct to say it. Earning status is something that I, it's like, fine, you want to be part of the team, you want to earn your way on the team, then guess what? Um, if you're, the, if, if you're the type of person we want in our communities, then guess, I, I think you ought to have the opportunity to earn it. I'm, I'm trying not to be obtuse. I think that was pretty direct. No, they're being nice to you. There's been, a bunch of people going, yeah, it was direct. They're being, they're being nice to you. Next question, kind of getting off of immigration and DACA. What about health care? Are we ever going to get something done on that? Um, well, I, I can tell you, uh, th thanks for going to, to another kind of cream puff thing. Um, 
So the build up to the health care vote, which was, what was it, last year or 18 months ago? Let me just take you through some of the things because once again, the perception, the perception out there kind of t tends to take over when you do your homework. And so when the proposal had first come out, we sent the proposal to uh, the guy's name is Whitley. He's, he's, he's in the state here, runs, he's the Medicaid guy. So remember, now when we start, you had traditional Medicaid. And then the Obama administration expanded Medicaid. Traditional Medicaid was for, was for sick people who weren't 65 yet, uh, pregnant women, children. Um, and I used to say old folks, but, but it's like, well, that's kind of, I guess it's old folks that weren't 65 yet. Since I just turned 60, the definition of old folks is changing. <laughs> So I feel wrecked. Oh, God, I wish I could go back where I could. Anyhow, so anyhow, that was traditional Medicaid. The first thing I will tell you is this. Anytime that somebody says they're going to take your Medicaid away, the first thing I say, are you talking about traditional Medicaid? Because there's no proposal to change that. Medicaid. I'm getting to Medicare. So the first thing they say, you've ruined Medicaid and you're going to kick 20 million people off Medicaid. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Nothing in the health care bill that the House did played with traditional Medicaid. It was Medicaid expansion, which was, if you can't qualify for anything else, sign up and, and the federal government basically pays 90 cents out of every dollar on the bill. And, and I'll just tell you this. It's like, great idea. Um, wish everybody, but it's like, you know, we're the folks who are, who are borrowing 40 cents of every dollar that we spend at the moment. Except for the last few months after that tax thing, you Omni people. I hope we get a chance to talk about that. But, but I'm sure we will. But, but anyhow, it's one of those things where it's like, qu quite frankly, we can't keep paying the bill, 90, 90 cents of the bill. And, and the governor w was opposed to this. Like, well, I don't blame him. Heck, if somebody was paying 90 cents out of, out of every dollar for, a for one of my programs, I'd probably be for him too. The problem is, from the perspective of somebody who's got to be responsible for that, it's like, we need to find a different way. And so, when the bill first came out, we sent it to this Whitley guy and say, what happens in Nevada if this bill becomes law? We get the report back in four years, we're gonna be a half a billion dollars in debt, we the state, and um, I forget how many people it was, it's, it, it's like, are, are, gonna be, are gonna have no health insurance. Now mind you, when this all started, Nevada was at about 22, 24% of the population was uninsured. Now that doesn't mean that they, I, I mean, what were they doing? Well, it's since the, the mid 80s, you went to the emergency room, which is a phenomenally inefficient, expensive way to access healthcare, so it's like we can do better in terms of providing that, let's figure out what the deal is. So they came back and said, this is how many people are going to be off and you're going to be half a billion dollars in debt. And I said, having spent some time in the legislature, I said, I know where those people will go to get that half billion dollars and it will be to the private sector. And so I'm not doing that to my state. I'm not. And, and by the way, if you're on something, then, then we need to try to find a way to make sure that you have something instead of nothing. So I said, I'm a no. Um, we, you know, we, we didn't vote. And so a few more weeks went by, and I'm pulling, into, uh, I'm pulling up to the gate at Reagan, flying back, and, and my phone rings, and it's, you know, unknown number. Or some, there's something that comes up where it's like, oh, this is somebody who's really important because when they call, their number doesn't pop up. I, I don't have one of those numbers, in case you're wondering. <laughs> it says the fat guy from Carson's calling. But anyhow... Um, so, it's, so I, I pick up the phone, nice young lady's voice says, uh, Congressman Amaday, uh, will you hold for President Trump? Uh, and I'm, I'm sitting here, <laughs> I'm a window seat guy. So I start to tell her, I go, well, you know, you might want to let him know that, that, that I'm with like 250 of my closest and most personal friends pulling up to gate 19 on a Delta jet. At, and, and, and you know, about three quarters of the way through, I go, well, they don't care about any of that stuff. Sure enough, hey, Mark, how you doing? How's things going? And I'm just, I'm just kind of sitting there like, how cool am I? You finally get a call, probably the only call in your life from the President of the United States, and you're like, I'm guessing this plane's full of Democrats. I don't want them to know who I'm talking to. But anyhow, 
Short conversation. We really need your help. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, Mr. President, thanks a lot. Hang up the phone. Um, get off the plane, go to the office, and uh, uh, I walk in, and my scheduler says, hey, the speaker wants to see in his office after votes. I go, gee, I wonder what that's all about. <laughs> after votes, go there, and there's Paul Ryan, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise. They're three staff members because we'd been working with staff a lot, asking questions and whatever, and being the frustrated lawyer that I am, I had a little one-sheeter that said, here's what I'm going to know, here's who I talked to, here's what they said. So, so anyway, we're going, and, 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 and so the speaker goes, well, where are you at? And then I go, here's my little handout. Um, and I go, these guys have it. And this ought to scare you a little bit. Paul Ryan looks up at the ceiling and he goes, I think we put something in the bill for states that, that had expanded Medicaid. And, and so I look over at the three staff experts and I go, we've been talking for three weeks. I said, that's great. I says, this is not a trust thing, but I'd really like to see the language. So by the next morning, we had the language. Uh, Tom Price, who was then the Health and Human Services Secretary, calls up and he says, hey, we got that. Did you get the language we sent over? Yep. And I'm going, wow, this is nothing works this fast in D.C. And so I go, yeah. Um, I said, can you kind of um, walk us through that? He says, yeah, I'll have Shima Verma call you in, in, in the next 10 minutes. Shima Verma was Pence's Medicaid person in the state of Indiana when he was the governor. And so anyhow, she calls up. We go through it with uh, uh, Stephanie Walker, who was my, my ledge staff person who was, who's on health care. And so we go through it, and it's like, here's the way it works for, for, for you. This is the proposal in the bill. If you are on Medicaid expansion at the time that this bill passes, you can stay on it until you're 65, i.e., we will not kick you off. Um, and when you get 65, you go on Medicare. So the deal about kicking people off, unless you elect to go off because you've got an employer plan or by the way, in order to be eligible for this, you had to be at 138% of poverty. So if you made too much money, then you weren't eligible by virtue of just the way the program worked, whether there was a new bill or not. So the only way you left it was you turned 65, you made too much money, or you elected to go on somebody else's health plan. Okay. Um, and by the way, while you're on it, the federal government will continue to pay 90 cents of every dollar that you spend on it. Well, there goes, the, there goes the half a billion dollars out the window. Those were my two main issues. And so, um, and, and listen, I'm not being disrespectful to the Nevada people. It's like, listen, the bill was a complex bill. They shot their shot, but so I said, okay, I, I, need, a, I need a favor. I'm talking to Ms. Verma. I said, I need you to Mr. Whitley in Nevada, who's the Medicaid guy. Now, she's the lady who writes the Medicaid checks in her position by virtue of, of the relationship with Pence and whatever. And by the way, she's still in that job. She hasn't taken first-class tickets to Borneo or whatever. So anyhow, she calls the Nevada guy up, has the conversation, says, We're paying, if, if this becomes the law, here's how this stuff works. Okay. We get done with that. Um, scheduler walks back in, and she goes, uh, Vice President Pence wants to see in his Capitol office after votes this afternoon. Don't these people have something to do other than bug me? <laughs> Wonder what he wants to talk about. So go in there after votes, and, and, and the Vice President's there, Shima Verma, Tom Price, their staff people or whatever, and he says, so where are we at on this? And, and I said, I says, first of all, that lady over there has been great. I, I just want you to know. She's been wonderful to work with. She's been timely. It's been Baba allows you to do things in real time. I said my two issues were the money and kicking people off, and and those have been resolved. Um, and he goes, so so where are we at? And I said I need one more thing. And I know you're all thinking, yeah, you want to go bowling and you want to lean against the nose wheel of Air Force One and give it one of these. Or I, I says. I need Ms. Verma to send my legislative director an email. I said, I don't want a letter on letterhead. I don't want an affidavit sworn and triple sealed and all that. I just want an email saying, this is the date that I talked to Mr. Whitley in Nevada, who's the Medicaid guy, and here's what I told him. 
Now, don't ask me, you know, why would you do that? And it's like, yeah, it's just like, you know what? I just feel better when I'm sitting on a phone book these days for some reason. Um, you know, belt, suspenders, the whole. And, uh, and so Pence looked at her and he said, I want him to have that by 5 o'clock today. Then he looked at me and I said, I'm a yes. That's kind of. Find out what the facts are. Here's my concerns. Your concerns are addressed. I'm with you. And of course. You know, then I was a dirty, rotten SOB because even though my, you know, it's like, oh, my God, you were supposed to vote no. It's like my issues have been taken care of. I'm not voting no for to be Don Quixote. Um, so, so anyhow, it was a yes. And so it goes out there. Um, we pass it, although it's interesting. You remember the, the president had a kegger in the Rose Garden for everybody to go yeehaw, which is, and we didn't go to that. And listen, nobody's ever accused me of being a classy guy. I'm going, that just doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Um, and, and then the next day he says, well, in the Senate, I want something with a little more heart. And I won't say what I thought about that. It's like, but anyhow, um, it goes over the Senate. It loses by one vote. And, and so here we are. And it's like, hey, guess what? We haven't resolved anything. So what we've been doing is continuing to try to refine our proposal. You've got the community health centers in Nevada. You got like six or seven in, in Washoe County. You got another uh, 10 or 11 th throughout uh, Congressional District 2. You got a bunch more in Las Vegas. Doing a pretty good job of getting people in, managing their care, doing it in the most cost-efficient manner there is. I can tell you to end it up right here, right now, some of you who, who don't remember cassettes may remember when we had the medical health care crisis in Nevada, Kenny Gwynn said, we're forming our own medical malpractice company because docs can't get insurance and they got to have insurance. And so I'm sitting there looking at this and we've gone down the road quite a bit to go. Will there always be federal money in health care? Yes. So those people that run around going, oh, my God, you know, it's like, listen, we're not going to say forget it. Medicare's over. Medicaid's over. Good luck. Um, but. The idea of it being managed from Washington, where kind of one size tries to fit all, whether it's Chicago, whether it's Raleigh, whether it's San Francisco, whether it's Boise, it's like, guess what? Give the states the money and let them do their own thing. And now, some of you may be affiliated with some of the major health insurance companies. I got to tell you, I've kind of had it with them. It's like, really, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to pay you billions of dollars a year in taxpayer subsidies? Because as near as I can figure, I don't know anybody who's age 40 or over that, that isn't pre-existing, which translates to you got to pay a hell of a lot for your stuff, for, for your premiums, because you're pre-existing. And so it's like, with all due respect, I get it that you don't want to insure people that might have claims. That's a hard thing to do when a large portion of your population is baby boomers. And I'm finding this out. I didn't think it would apply to me. It's like when you get older, stuff starts to hurt, and it wasn't because of an injury. And so, yeah, it's like, what the heck happened there? It was fine yesterday. Um, so anyhow, I mean, what, what we're looking at is saying, how do we move this money? And, and some people, well, it's block grants or whatever. It's like, I don't know what the nomenclature is. But from talking with, like, the young lady who's running the exchange, Heather Korbelik or something like that is her name, in Nevada right now, there are some capable people. It's like, um, and, and let me tell you what, it's, all, it's already being done on a smaller scale. Uh, MGM has 60,000 employees. They started contracting direct with providers in southern Nevada and said, we're going to rate you every year, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? When our people come to you, you're not going to have to call somebody you're not going to have to hire six people for every physician to, to try to comply with the administrative stuff. We're going to pay you direct. Here we go. And guess what? First couple years, costs went up because you had people that had access to health care that didn't have it before. Oh, and by the way, if you're one of those people and they tell you to take your blood pressure medicine, I hear some people use that, not me. Um, only at night. Um, <laughs> Anyhow, you have to be compliant. So if, if they say take blood pre pressure medicine, you're not taking it, th then your employer's coming in going, hey, I'm paying for your health care. Do what the heck you're supposed to do for your preventative stuff. Guess what? They started opening that up to businesses in Southern Nevada, that, like the dry cleaner or the surveying firm or the whatever, uh, to, to say, listen, here's what it is. Here's how much an employee, in other words, they think they've got a better mousetrap. And they probably do. So I can tell you that, that when you get back to this, it's like, we're not going to get rid of Medicare and Medicaid and stuff like that, but it's like, 
you know what, for that whole insurance, the, the private insurance industry stuff, it's like, let the states create their own, their own entities or hire somebody to create them, but it keeps closer to the physicians and the patients and it gets a lot cheaper then. And, and so that's what we're, what we're trying to push it and, and continue to work on it so that when the powers that be decide we're, we're gonna do something again, um, th that we're ready to go, here you go, and, and we're trying to kind of push those rocks uh, right now with them so that when it starts, it's not a new concept. Yes, sir. Thank you. Next and very last question, then we'll open it up to the public. You can have a drink of water or something. When are you gonna run for speaker? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I used to say never, but I'm mad enough now to where it's like I might do it just to just if it'll give if it'll give somebody a nightmare even for part of the night. <laughs> it's like, um, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, although it's been an interesting year because um, I don't know what was it four or five months ago. I'm talking to Sam Shad and Ray Hager on this obscure little radio program in in Nevada, and it's a Friday and. You know, it's like no, nobody listens to these things, no big deal. And, and so we're getting ready to do the last thing or whatever. And, and, uh, and Sam goes, hey, what rumors have you heard? And I go, and, and as a matter of fact, I just, and I go, well, ask me when we're on the air. Um, so he does. And I said, well, I heard that uh, the speaker's leaving before Easter and Scalise is going to be the next speaker. Pretty straightforward question, pretty straightforward answer. In hindsight, there was nothing going on in the nation on that Friday. <laughs> and so, don't ask me what, John Ralston was doing listening to Sam Shad, but he was, and then he tweets it or teeter-totters it or whatever that stuff is, and all of a sudden it's like, my, my communications per, blah, blah, <laughs> and I'm going, I said like rumor six times in the answer. Well, if you want to know what the rumor is, if you're into rumors, the rumor I heard, it's just a rumor is, Cheese Boy's gone and Scalise is the guy. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think the national press guys, one of them's going, oh, he's a backbench Republican and all this stuff. And, and, and I'm going, I don't even know this guy. What's it? And it's like, I think he was getting ready to go home early and because you popped off, he had to stick around and write a story. And so, two weeks later, whatever, when, when, when Ryan goes, hey, I'm not running again, I, I told my, I go, hey, call that, that genius up over there at the whatever and tell him, sometimes the view from the back bench is pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, um, here's what I've told, because I've, I've talked with Kevin McCarthy, and Kevin McCarthy's been a very helpful guy to me. Obviously, Steve Scalise has been a great friend, and I've talked to Jim Jordan, too, and I told all three of them, I said this, I go, you know what, McCarthy's strong point is his staff, N not that anybody's got a bad one, but I mean, when you go to his staff and say, I got a problem and I need some help, you get some help. And I'll just tell you, I think that's unusual with, with committee and leadership staffs back there, in my experience. That may hurt some feelings of some staff members back there, but it's like, all I know is, 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 is that if we weren't as tenacious as we were and, and not going, oh, accept a no for an answer and just walking away, that, and I don't need to go any farther down that road. But the question that I asked all three of them, I said, tell me what's going to change. And, and, and it's, I don't mean it disrespectfully, but it's kind of where we started with the discharge petition. If you put those two bills to the floor under a closed rule and say, here they are, and you can't change them, and you got to vote up or down, and you can't try to be a legislator and say, I want to tweak the DACA piece this way. I want to tweak the investor visa part this way or whatever. It's like, hey, if I don't get 218 votes, I don't lose, but I don't win. But that's the process. And so if those come to the floor on a, on a closed rule, then I'll just tell you. I mean, I was thinking when I was driving over here, I'm going, maybe I'll call up some of the folks on the other side and have everybody say, hey, why don't, why don't we all vote pres present? <laughs> and you go, what would that do? It's like, well, the only thing I would arguably do in my mind is go, let us be legislators with all due respect. And I don't care whether you're Nancy Pelosi or Paul Ryan. It's like this bit where you get a half a dozen people in a room and the staff folks and you have your little meeting and then you come out and you go, here's the deal. And you go, well, you know, we actually know something about this area. And, and would you think, no, no, we can't. Here's the deal. Get on or get off. And it's like, well, you know what, that's good when, you, when you're getting votes for a Supreme Court opinion, or that's good when you're in the executive branch with a chief executive that goes, 
I'm running the company and this is what we're doing. That's all well and good. This is supposed to be the one where you got 535 of us so that in the case of the 435 on the south end, the wrong side of the tracks, who represent about three quarters of a million people, uh, three quarters of a million people, that you can say this is kind of close to groups where you can say, hey, I went to something and some guy had an idea about nuke something or, you know, this, that, or the other sort of thing. Don't. I'll just finish with this. It is the ultimate act of disrespect to not allow the, your members who made you the speaker be legislators. That's as nice as I can say it. All right, next, I want to have people, if you want to ask Mark questions, come up here to the front, to the mic, and ask questions. And we have about 15 minutes. One of them that I want to, yeah, the gear toward is the upcoming spending legislation yeah. along that. But let them ask them questions and get a chance to do okay. yeah. it. Uh, Identify yourself and ask Ben Keenan, picking up on what you said about your little lawyer cheat sheet, when we look at, not DACA because the bills in theory are going to be voted on, uh, so it isn't discharge, but we have Good Ladder, the Secure America's free Future. Yep. Then we have Ryan's, quote, compromise, which is, I think it's the... Uh, border security and immigration reform. In an immigration reform, Ryan's, they don't do anything about sanctuary cities. They don't have E-Verify, which two weeks ago, the Social Security Administrator came out and said, we need E-Verify for Social Security to prevent Social Security fraud. And in the language of DACA, it says not only DACA, but and others. And the and others is wide open. So on your cheat sheet, if you could, would you say yay or nay on sanctuary cities and yay or nay on E-Verify? And can we amend it so we don't have others and have this, since we're only going to vote on it once in the next 35 years. <laughs> I didn't mean to turn you into a cynic. It sounds to me like you were partly already there. But anyhow, for, first of all, I, I'm with you on E-Verify. Quite frankly, I don't think that's Republican, Democrat, whatever. It's like, why are people trying to come into the country not through the way they're supposed to? And, and, and the answer for the most part is, and, unless they're the terrorists, just bad, evil people, it's economic opportunity. The way the system is now, the biggest risk you have to access that is can I get through the border and into whatever my community is? Because once I get there, if I can make that deal work, then it's like, yeehaw, that my chances of getting caught are. And so the reason that E-Verify is so important is you go, listen, even if you get across the border, you're going to be put through this, this federal data bank that basically is going to identify you as either somebody who is a citizen, is in the country legally, or who is not. And therefore, you're not going to be able to get your job. And it also, and listen, I'm not a guy that says make it the employer's problem. It's like, if you as an employer or your contractor accesses that system and gets a green light, then it's get out of jail free for you. But if you're skipping it, then it's like, that's a problem. And so I'm all with you on E-Verify. You're right, it isn't in there now, which is one of the things where it's like, I think there's 218 votes to put E-Verify in the bill. So if they bring it to the floor with a closed rule and you can't put E-Verify in there, you're like, that's kind of like one of the basic building blocks. And, and so what was the second part, real? Oh yeah, well here's the sanctuary city issue. Remember that little line in the Constitution? Now we've put stuff, uh, I started out on the Judiciary Committee, yeah, um, I started out on the Judiciary Committee, which guess what? That's, that's immigration jurisdiction. Was on Trey Gowdy's Special Committee on Immigration. Did all this work, and we actually passed some stuff out of committee, never heard of it again on the floor. And, and so you're going, so then you get to sanctuary cities and it's like, as an appropriator now, 
I mean, we've put stuff in that says you can't have the money, you can't have the money. And listen, I don't know Jeff Sessions that well, and God knows I'm not an expert on the Department of Justice. All I can tell you is from as an outside guy looking in, justice looks like a mess to me. And with that line in, in, in the, uh, it, it's like, listen, this is not a state's rights argument. Until justice grows some bullhorns trying to clean up my profanity-laced tirades. Um, it's, it's, it's like, listen, we've, we've put the mechanism in to cut off the money. Um, it, it's like executive branch, go enforce that. And you know, it's like, well, it's California. It's like, yeah, I know it's California. No offense. I mean, most people in this room are probably from California, but I would remind you that you're now from California instead of in California. So I, I, I'm with you on that where it's, where it's like, listen, I don't know if there's a lot of legislative work needs to be done. We put the money tool in there. The Sanctuary City something was, was quite frankly, the beachhead was established during the Obama administration where they said, do whatever you want, we're not going to do anything. So now the challenge for Jeff Sessions is, you got to go do something. Yes. Hi. For the record, Eddie Lorton Farino, Mayor. How you doing, sir? Good to see you again. I ended up, uh, I had a question. There was a town hall meeting that Mr. Dean Hiller did, and I asked him this certain question. I voted for him. I also voted for you. And we were talking about how they were trying to get stuff passed and everything, and I wonder why you don't go nuclear on anything as to where use Harry Rule, Reed's rule against them and try to get stuff passed. And his comment was, oh, Eddie, we're going to work together, watch and see. But I don't see that happening. So I, I'm a result-oriented person. So if we're not getting stuff passed, because he says the pendulum swings, if we do that, we only might be in office three or four more years. But my take is if we don't get nothing done, you might be out now. So I'm wondering why we don't know nuclear, use their own rule against them, get more stuff done, and what's your take on that? Well, and, 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 and I mean, there's a lot of people talking about that. And I'll tell you this, I, I mean, at the start of this process, I was kind of, well, that's the rule, and, and this allows smaller states to say and uh, disproportionately, other than it does in the House, where it's just, but I got to tell you, the history, um, I, I just look at the history from, from when it's been really my day job to know the history. And it's like, listen, um, I'll, I'll just tell you, I think the dynamic bears very little resemblance to what it was for the first, you know what, 200 plus years of the country. And, and so this whole thing where the Senate has become something where, where gridlock is considered um, the status quo and accepted is off. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm the guy in the House got 400 some odd bills sitting over there. You know, McConnell says, hey, we're going to be in, in in August. And somebody says, well, what about you guys? Like, well, what about us? Well, when they get through that 430, I'll come back. You know, if it's done in August, whatever, it's like, come on. Um, the fact that we passed it doesn't mean that it's perfect and everybody else should bow down, but it's like th these people don't even acknowledge that it's passed. It's not like you call it up in a committee meeting and say, does anybody want to hear this? You know, or, 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 there's no process. And, and, and there is no bigger example than the appropriations process. For the last two years, the House has sent all 12 appropriations bills over seven months before the end of September 30th. Guess what? We're more than halfway through right now as we sit here. So guess what? In about two, three more weeks, they'll all be over there. And they have done. They've waited until 14 days before the lights go out. And then they put the beautiful people behind closed doors on both sides, both parties. And they sit there and come out and you go, well, what about the thing that I did for, oh, that's not in there. Well, what do you mean it's not in there? Uh, you know, staff talked and whatever. And, 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 you know, and then you get your, the Omni and everybody's going, what are you guys doing? It's so like, don't ask me. I mean, you can see how I voted in committee, on the floor, on the bill. Amendments both sides, roll call, if, if you are if you've got a real strong constitution, you can watch it on C-SPAN 6 or 4 or whatever it is. It's like completely transparent, and then it goes over there into a black hole, and they're like, well, here's the, here's the working group stuff. It's kind of like the family meeting. So, to bring it on around, it, it, it's like, listen, I, I, I think it may be, it, it, I think there's a strong argument now for, hey, guess what? The rule in the Senate's the same. You get to 51. There you go. So yes. Yep. All right. Thank you. You bet. Appreciate it. 
Good morning. Hi. My name is Denise Mraz. I'm with Don't California or Nevada. It's a group. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about 5G. Do you know anything about the 5G network? Tell me a little bit about it. Okay. 5G network are those big, ugly towers that are going up about on a grid every mile, half mile in all our major urban areas. And they're on the highways going to from, say, Reno to Las Vegas. Okay. 5G network is, uh, well, it's fatal. In fact, uh, UNR just received a $5 million grant from our military to find out how much 5G can we, we can withstand that we don't end up a human puddle on the floor because our skeletal muscles will no longer be attached to our skeleton. They're supposed to study how much of this we can take before we get really sick and just turn into a human Have puddle. a pre-existing condition for insurance purposes, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Pre-existing condition, right? What you said earlier. And currently, the um, uh, FCC is entertaining bandwidth contracts. And these bandwidth contracts are the same ones that the $5 million grant to UNR is to study to find out how long we can take it before we, we're, we won't be killed, but we'll be really bad off. So Trump signed the 5G bill that was passed by the House and the Senate, but the science with the bill was all from the 1980s. He was never shown the actual science, and I don't know that Congress was either. That is the contemporary science that they know that this is for uh, cryptocurrency, driverless cars, and it's, it's lethal. Okay. So I wanted to find out, can you do something about this now that it's a bill? Um, the answer is, make sure we know how to get a hold of you. Okay. So that, so, so that we can call you and say, give me your information so we can go to work on it. All right, thanks. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Congressman. Uh, my question has to do with military retiree health care, uh, specifically TRICARE. Um, to me, this is an issue that's probably in the rearview mirror, but I'm still heated about this. In 1990, I took an oath of enlistment. I did 24 years in the military. Once I retired... What branch? Army. Okay, good. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Once... I, I, I'm sure you're aware earlier this year, TRICARE, um, I guess with approval from Congress, changed the policy. And uh, our health care coverage is now, our co-pays have increased by 300%. Um, there was talk that we would be grandfather claused in. And that never happened. And I just don't, for me, it's hard to fathom. You know, I live in northern Nevada. I take my PTSD medication. I used to use Express Scripts. They sent us generics, which I'm fine with. Used to be free. Now they charge us for that. And the, the answer for when I call is I could go to a military installation and pick up my medication. But for me, that's not feasible. So first of all, I wanted to know, is there, can, can there be any kind of exemption that we could get when you're not around a military base? I know Nevada is trying to bring a lot of military retirees here, um, but if you're not near a base, it's kind of worthless for us for our health care. And also, um, the increase, I just don't understand how we were not grandfather claused in. And with all the issues with passing health care for everybody in different departments, it seemed like it was so easy to pass this one off to the veterans because it just seems we're such a small population. We don't flip cars, we don't protest. And so it just seems like we, we got messed over. And I don't understand how that happened, how we just eat the increases overnight. A few things. First of all, make sure my guy knows, have, have you spoke with Tracy Soliday in our office? Uh, negative. Negative. Okay, well we need to fix that. I mean, I, 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 you know. Anyhow, Tracy. Um, so you're not good with names. Talk to Arturo. <laughs> hey, they both start with S. That's good for me. Um, get a hold of Arturo, and I'll have Tracy Spears, Soliday, Superman, whatever, <laughs> um, give you a call this coming week so, so that we can find out exactly what's going on with you. Second of all, I had the TRICARE folks in my office last week to go, you're not doing so good in northern Nevada. You got the circle from somewhere, and well, you used to have a clinic in, at Herlong, and you still got one at Fallon. And so depend, there can be people on opposite sides of the street in Reno where the lines come, and you're different than the, than the guy or girl across the street. So we're working on that. The third thing is we don't set 
what those deductibles are, when we give DOD their money, then we go, now don't go, let me be careful with my choice of words here. Don't go oh, just let it rip. <laughs> buggering. That's an improvement for me. Um, don't go hosing those, those, the, the folks in the TRICARE because TRICARE isn't a VA thing, it's a DOD thing. And so it's like, quite frankly, right now, it's worse to be in TRICARE. Um, the, the, the VA folks, I mean, with healthcare, the standard is always perfection. And, and so the dumbest thing anybody could say is like mission accomplished. It's like, that's just dumb. So while you may not achieve it, you always strive for it. So um, that's why I had the TRICARE folks in going, so we gave you all these increases, and, and I know there's a lot of needs in DOD, but TRICARE always seems to be one of the ones, when I was in it was Champus. That's how old I am. Um, but, but anyhow, that always seems to be one of the ones where, where you make up, uh, you DOD make up for, well, we don't need to do much of that, and we'll do more of that here and there. So we've got that ongoing. We've got a Veterans Town Hall that's coming up where the TRICARE people are gonna be here. So when you let us know, when you get a hold of Tracy Spears, um, <laughs> then, then we'll, you'll, you'll be in the deal for when that is, but we'll give you, we'll give you some personalized attention on the, on the script stuff and also look at how your, uh, how your deductibles went up, make sure that that's all squared away. Yes, sir. Jim Snyder. Uh, Mark, you've, uh, you've gone on record as denying it, but you really are a classy guy. But you're, you're articulate and you're high profile. What can you, <laughs> what can you tell uh, Hispanics to reduce their anxiety level over how they've been maligned by some of the administration's rhetoric and policy? Well, and, and you know, I mean, great question, because it's just like, listen, here's the, here, here's the fish sitting in the middle of the table. Let's talk about it. Let, let me tell you what we've done, uh, and, and when push comes to shove and you're in the D.C. world, I'll, I'll just tell you what I've done is like, listen, um, going to Wisconsin and throwing eggs at Paul Ryan's house or going to San Francisco and throwing them at Nancy Pelosi's house or whatever is one of those things where you're like, yeah. But it, it's like, so when it comes down to it, it's like, what can I control? And so that's, I can control what I say to the people that gave me this responsibility. So what we've been doing is, is we do quarterly town hall Hispanic business owner meetings. We have done several immigration town halls where it's like, you know, it's like, hey, this isn't gonna be fun, but we need to have the discussion so it's like, it's out there. I will tell you that I've said this pu publicly, I, I go, and, and this gets back to, it's like, so we're sitting here as Republicans, and not that you can paint us all with the same brush or whatever, we're a fairly independent lot, but you sit there and you go, family values, spiritual, self-sufficient, you know, the vast majority of these people are like, these are good, hardworking, spiritual, family values people. And you're going, oh God, we can't have them affiliated with the Republican Party. And listen, I mean, I'm maybe kind of making a joke, but then again, I'm not. And so you sit there and look at that, and you say, listen, and, and by the way, remember, this all happens in the present communications atmosphere, which is nothing like it has ever been before. And I'm not saying it's going to change. It should change. I'm just saying the reality is that there are a heck of a lot of people in the national media business. And by the way, I'm a Republican. They're making money. As long as you're not breaking the law, that's, that's a good thing. And the more you make, we tend to call you that, that successful. They're making a ton of money doing what they're doing in the perception business, but the facts, as I hope some people will leave here and go, I didn't know that, and listen, please go fact check me. Don't take my word for it, it's like, go fact check. But you're sitting there, as these things like, oh, they hate them all, and I'm sitting here going, and I mean, that gets back, it's like, I am tired of being defined by a discussion which has absolutely no voting record to back it up. And so, when you say, what do you tell these people, it's like, I'll, First of all, my view of that is I'm responsible to the ones that are in my neck of the woods. Uh, now, we've talked with some folks nationally, too, but it's one of them things where it's like, listen, here are the facts that we've got right now. We are where we are right now. Whether the 35-year-old thing were, that the Reagan administration, it's like, that's great for chatting over orange juice or something, but here's what I got in front of me right now. 
And so I, I think w what the message is this, is like, first of all, let's talk about the border briefly. There's no modern country that says, I don't care what happens on my border. I'm sorry, I, I just don't know of one. Or if they don't, it's because they got much bigger problems. I've used the example, I go, I go, you don't get off a of Volaris Airlines flight in Reno and just stroll through with your carry-on and go down to the Atlantis and start playing blackjack and drinking a beer. They go, who are you? Where are you coming from? So the whole border thing to me is like, of course we want to know what's going on on our border. Not just the Southwest one, but the border that's in every international airport, that thing up north that has 5,000 miles and trees. Think about that, as well as those ports. You know, it's not the old days where you had to come into Philadelphia, uh, Ellis Island, and San Francisco. And so it's like, I think what you, what you tell them is this. We've got a set of rules. We expect you to respect them. We've got a system which needs some work, but you need to, you need to operate within that system. But it's like, quite frankly, if you're, if you're, I mean, it's kind of like the earlier DACA discussion. If you're willing to earn your status and you're the type of, of, of person that's like, hey, we need those type of folks, then there you go. Um, I see nothing to be gained regardless of what your politics are to say, you know, uh, I, I just see nothing for, for the stereotypes and, and all the... Uh, all the whatever talk it's like listen i've got i've got feelings about it but quite frankly when you're talking about making policy it's like what are the facts and what's a way forward and how do we do it transparently because i don't have all the answers i mean there's a couple things that happened today where's the lady 5g i thought that was five grand when you started <laughs> so anyhow it's like, five grand that's a lot of money um so anyhow it, it's like and I guess that's why my passion for things, this process needs to be transparent and open and you need to have the members be able to participate to bring that interaction with the people that they work for forward. And what I found on, on a lot of the Hispanic issues is, it's like, this is, there's a bunch of, and listen, I don't know Laura Ingram, okay? I mean, I talked with her once on the radio during the thing, and she didn't think I was enthusiastic enough, so she kind of chastised me on the radio. But it was early, and it was like, hey, I was calling from home. I was kind of relaxed. By the time I hung up the phone, I'm like, I'm like this. But anyhow, with all due respect to Laura Ingram, I don't think it moves the issue forward, backwards, or sideways for every time you say immigration reform, somebody screams amnesty. And I even said, I want to think, I said, can somebody define amnesty for me? I, I mean, just tell me what it is, and, and then I'll, if it's a bad, I'll stay away from it or whatever. So when we talk about any of these, whether it's health care, whether it's the budget, whether it's immigration, all it's like, hey, I can, I can handle the facts. And that doesn't mean we'll always be in agreement, but at least we will have had a discussion about, here's the facts, Here's what I think is important, and here's what I did. So that, oh, God forbid, I screw up. You can go, where you're missing it is here. But if it's all the talking point screaming contest, then, then what happens is you get, you get absolutely all of the stereotypes, which is a bad way to make policy. Yes, sir. The people at table six need to go. They need to go out in the parking lot and have a sub-meeting. Steve Wittord, and thank you for coming today, and Congressman, I appreciate you taking uh, the time to do this. And Ray, I'll do my very best to be brief. I want to come back to the immigration issue. Uh, I think what we've observed for the last 25 years is a complete failure by Congress, Democrat and Republican, yeah. Yeah. where we continue to deal with symptoms, we never deal with the cause. And largely that's true of Congress. Even if you go to health care, we've got kids now that are all uh, early diabetic by the age of 20 because they're overweight and everything else like that. We could probably have free health care if, you know, if I'd lose 20 pounds, you know, do the things that we need to do to get it right. Deal with the cause rather than the symptoms. Everything that you talked about so far with respect to DACA signing on with the, uh, uh, the discharge petition and everything else like that, with the Democrats who 
to a person will not solve the underlying problem, which is a porous border, but they're happy to have you on board to deal with all the symptoms that we have. Reagan tried that 25 years ago, and the problem now is immeasurably worse than it was then. And if we don't solve this border issue, 25 years, it will be one hell of a lot worse than it is today. So my question to you is, will you introduce clean, led, uh, clean or singular legislation that will specifically say, and this president, whether people are thrilled with him or not, who ran every time on build the wall? Americans are inherently generous. They're, they're really wonderful, wonderful people. And they're very welcoming people. But they don't want to solve a problem that simply continues to increase the scope of the problem. And once we get that border established, we can have all these other debates about how we're going to deal with the symptoms. But if we continue to deal with the symptoms without dealing with the cause, we're never going to get to a solution. Thank you. Yep. So, so the wall and funding. Here you go. Quickly. Um, First of all, absolutely the southwest border. It's 2,000, 1,900 miles long. Got it. Okay, but, but, but I also know, and this is not a predicate to say we don't need to do anything about it. We do. We should. Um, the administration asked for 70, 74 miles of, of, of barriers in, in the fiscal year that ends this September. We gave him 90. Mick Mulvaney asked for 74. We gave him 90. Now, now remember, it ends in September. So then you get into, there's some people that feel about fiscal response. How much money can you spend between now and September intelligently on a major construction project? I don't know the answer to that, but I know it's a good question. And so you say, yeah, but we don't want to be at the mercy of future Congresses. We want you to pre-fund it at $25 billion. Okay, what do you got for me in there? One of the things that they talked about, which quite frankly is an idea that I think is, 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 it's like, hell, I'd support that generally, which is this. Okay, we're going to put that in the bank account and you can draw on it. But we're not proceeding forward with this DACA fix unless that proceeds forward the same way. If the wall stops, and you know what, I, I, it isn't a wall. In different places, it's a this and a that, but that's the phrase we use. So if, if the border security for those 2,000 miles stops, then, then the DACA fix stops. It's like, okay, I'm all right with that contingency. I'm okay with that. But remember, as with any project, 1,900 miles long, we don't own it all. And you say, what's he going to say now? I'm not going to say anything other than it takes time to buy property, condemn property, you know, all that other sort of stuff. And so I'm not sitting there as a guy who's getting older and time becomes more precious going, it'll take care of itself. It won't. The, the, the border stuff was funded like 15, 20 years ago and nothing happened. But I am going to tell you this. I believe absolutely that needs to quit being, hell, there's 1,300 miles of it that are basically unsupervised right now. Now, three or 400 of it's pretty rugged stuff. So you're going, well, unless you're, you know, an Olympic athlete or something like that, you're probably going to make, but that still leaves some huge chunks which you can go, th it's like that needs to stop. But modern times, it's like it, it's, they're just coming and going. Heck, they're coming and going where there are barriers. But, but I do want to tell you this. Everybody loves the Gulf of Mexico to San Diego, okay? I got it. But let's not forget, I don't care if you absolutely shut that to zero incursions. It's like you've still got those ports. You've still got that other thing 5,000 miles up north. You've still got those airports. And so with, with all, it's like, fine, that's the priority. Make it the priority. You're not going to fix it, you know. It, but, but it's like it's you want the money in the bank so you don't have to, have to kiss old Rose. with a, That's fine. You, you tie it to DACA. I'm fine with all that. But guess what? I'm not sure that, that all that's going to end up in, in one of them, which is why you need to be able to amend the bill and see if there's 218 votes. And so I think the last thing he said, would you do a clean bill that says whatever? It's like, well, let me tell you what, if it's not in one of those two bills, <laughs> I would sure as heck offer an amendment to put it in, <laughs> if I can, unless it's a closed rule. I don't think that's controversial. I do not, as I sit here, think that the thought that a nation would want to control its borders has anything to do with Hispanics, Norwegians, Filipinos, Russians, anybody. It's like nations inherently want to control their borders, and they should. It's become a talking point of, oh, this is offensive. It's like, no, it's not. Anyhow, 
Does that answer your question? I wanted to, I wanted to thank Mark. I, I don't want to come off. He'll, I'm sure, will stay a little bit and answer questions with you. Well, he hasn't even had a chance to eat yet. Well, that's okay. I'm all right with eating. Huh? I'll be here. He'll be here. You, I know there are several I had to cut off, but in all fairness, just a couple of things. A quick announcement. Yeah, the oh, Trumpy is calling you, Mark. I told you never to call me here. <laughs> anyway, our next meeting won't be until August. However, however, in July 14th, the Washoe County, which I'm communications chairman, is having their second annual picnic at the Lazy Five uh, location in Sparks. We invite you to be there. We could use some help. Before that, we're also gonna be at Star Spangled Sparks in front of the Nugget to make people aware. And we could use some help, Liz. Uh, <laughs> I'm volunteering you. And, why well, no, yes. Yeah. Anyway, the next thing is, even though we're not going to have a, a time unless you want for meet the candidates before we do the 50-50, we're pretty much on time. But I am going to acknowledge some. Jeff, I think, had to leave church. Jeannie Herman is running again for county commissioner. Stand up. <laughs> Eddie Lorton is going to be our mayor. Stand up. Yeah. But he needs some help. You need to get out there and start helping him. And we do have at the GOP a, a phone bank and a whole program with interns. But we sure need some volunteers. So like I said, the doors close in about two minutes. You can't get out unless you volunteer. <laughs> Michael's taking a list. And oh, I'm Bonnie Weber is running for Reno City Council. And you have to, you, and she's running against a super liberal Democrat and a union guy. You gotta get her elected. What is that, in five? Four, Ward four. And you only vote by the ward, not the whole city. Uh, just by ward. This is Bill, and we just finished up the primaries. It did real well with some of our AdWords and targeted uh, videos. Just want to thank the Silver Sponsors for making this possible. All the research and the development we've done are helping these conservative principles that we are bringing forward by getting them out to the community. We've had over 200,000 views of our, our videos, as well as over 1.25 million impressions in the great state of Nevada. Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead and, if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. And go over here, watch a couple more videos. Link to our website at republicanmenstclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.